abscesses. Right-sided CSOM, right cerebellar abscess, pretty common. And how do you differentiate this from a tumor? Most of the abscesses have a nice smooth peripheral ring. The capsule is very well formed and you see a smooth peripheral enhancement in case of an abscess, unlike a tumor where it is garland or irregular type of an enhancement. Dural sinus thrombosis, again, is pretty common in case of CSOM. And you see this empty delta sign. When you give a contrast, the thrombosed part of the sinus does not enhance. The contralateral side is enhancing. The ipsilateral side shows thrombosis, called as empty delta sign, because it looks like a triangle, which is empty. Let us look at MR. You can do an MR venography. Similarly, you don't see enhancement within the right sigmoid here. The left sigmoid is enhancing. And MR venography shows no flow within the sigmoid sinus. So you can pick up dural sinus thrombosis also extremely well with CT or MR, preferably an MR. Now let us look at tumors. When it comes to tumors, paragangliomas, we have two types here. One is a glomus tympanicum, which is confined to the mid layer along the promontory. That is the commonest location. Or you also have jugular tympanicum, where you have a tumor within the jugular fossa going into the mid layer. It has two components, so we call it as jugular tympanicum. So let us see how imaging helps here. When we do a CT, have a look at this. You see enhancement along the promontory. You see the basal turn of the cochlea. You see the promontory so well here, and a soft tissue along the promontory. So you know you're dealing with a tumor within the inner ear. And this is not cholesteatoma because you don't see any erosion. And again, MR shows a bright signal on a T2-weighted sequence. So MR T2-weighted is extremely helpful. Diffusion-weighted is helpful. Post-contrast T1 is helpful. MR venography is helpful. Let us take an illustration of glomus jugular tympanicum here. This patient, you can see erosion of the jugular fossa. The right jugular fossa is normal and the left is eroded. You see the erosion so well. So CT is very, very important to look at bone erosions. And when we do an MR in these patients, you can look at the tumor within the jugular fossa. You see the tumor, which is enhancing, but the beauty of MR comes when you do a dynamic study. You can do a dynamic study, acquire the whole volume in less than five or six seconds, and you can run this again and again and again because there is no radiation, and you can also plot a curve. Look at this. There's a large mass sitting here. And then when you plot the wash-in, wash-out curves, you see there is a rapid wash-in of contrast and a rapid wash-out. Very, very classical for a paraganglioma. So when we do a dynamic contrast study on an MR, you can differentiate a paraganglioma from a non-paragangliomatous lesion. Trauma, there are two types here. Fractures. One is a longitudinal fracture and a transverse fracture. If a fracture occurs along the plane of the petrous temporal, along the plane is longitudinal. But if a fracture occurs perpendicular to it, it is a transverse fracture. Remember, along is longitudinal, perpendicular is a transverse fracture. And if the fracture again goes through the facial canal, it can involve the facial nerve, patient can have a element type facial palsy, or this patient had an incudomalleolar dislocation. Classical ice cream cone on the left, but look at the separation here of the joint, post-traumatic dislocation of incudomalleolar joint. Now, when it comes to inner ear, let's go through the inner ear. We have just 10 minutes remaining. Then we'll go to the auditory pathways of the brain. Very few slides then we can conclude. So whenever we look at the large vestibular aqueduct, it should measure less than 1.5 mm. Sir, how do I measure? I may not be able to measure. But what you do is look at the posterior semicircular canal, which is there, and then look at the vestibular aqueduct. Both these should be more or less the same diameter. But in this case, the vestibular aqueduct is much larger than the posterior semicircular canal here, so you know you're dealing with a dilated vestibular aqueduct. More than 1.5 mm, or the best way is compare it with the posterior semicircular canal, and you've got the answer. Let's go down. Cochlear vestibular malformations are very common. We will go from the most severe to the relatively less severe one. The most severe we all know is Michel, where 
almost the whole labyrinth is not seen. Okay, we had a case, but this is taken from a book where it shows complete absence of the inner ear structures. This is very, very, very severe form and very, very rare. But when we go down in the descending order of severity, this is a common cavity. So this patient does not have a cochlea, does not have a vestibule. Both are fused to form a common cavity. So this is again pretty common. And then one-fourth of all cochlear anomalies are common cavity malformations, where you cannot differentiate the vestibule from the cochlea. Let us look at this. Incomplete partition. This is the latest classifications which are come in IP1 and IP2. In incomplete partition 1, what you see here on the right is you have a cystic cochlea, you have a cystic vestibule. C is anterior, remember. How do you differentiate? I don't know which is cochlea, which is vestibule. Cochlea is always anterior, vestibule is posterior. So you can easily now make out that there is a cystic dilatation of the cochlea and cystic dilatation of the vestibule in an IP1 malformation. You can have a dwarf cochlea. Cochlea can be pretty small, but you still can see all the turns of the cochlea, but a very, very small cochlea. And in this patient, you also see there is an anterior migration of the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve. Normally, the facial nerve gradually curves up, hooks around as the first genu and comes down, but there is a slight anterior migration. Montini malformations are type 2, the IP2 types, where you don't have the complete turns of the cochlea and the interscalar septum between the middle and the apical turn is missing. And all this you can see on CT because it's a 0.2 or 0.3 mm. You can easily pick these up. So let us look at a normal cochlea here. Nice trifoliate thing. You see the apical turn here. And then you see a small interscalar septum. And you also see a modiolus here. Modiolus again will look bright or hyperdense. This is the modiolus. This is the apical turn. But look at this. Looks like a cystic area within the cochlea. Next. Apart from that, you can also pick up a dilated vestibular duct. Again, you see cystic dilatation of the cochlea, cystic dilatation of the vestibule, and a dilated vestibular aqueduct. So you can pick these up because these are all 0.6 mm or 0.3 mm sections. And you can also see the tympanic portion of the facial nerve along the medial margin of the middle ear so beautifully brought out. Bilateral Mondini, dilatation vestibule, loss of normal architecture of the cochlea, beautifully seen both sides. This is left, this is right. I've just cut this and brought them together. Ice cream cone normal, ossicles normal, IAMs normal. Otosclerosis. So how do you diagnose otosclerosis? The most important thing in otosclerosis is pick up demineralizations very, very early. And CT is the investigation of choice. Let us just look at a few examples here. In fenestral type of otosclerosis, look at this. This is normal. The bone should be dense or white in color, bright. But here you see a small hypodensity. So please remember, pitrus is a very, very dense bone. And any lucency you see within the pitrus is abnormal until proved otherwise. So if you see this just anterior to the oval window here, you know you're dealing with a fenestral type of otosclerosis. But you can also look at otosclerosis, retrofenestral. Look at this. There's gross demineralization in the retrofenestral area. And you can also look at cochlea, where you see a nice ring, what you call as the fourth turn of the cochlea, around the normal three turns. So you have to pick up any round hypodense area surrounding the cochlea is abnormal. Except the cochlea which appears hypodense, anything surrounding it is abnormal. So once you see a nice round turn, a demineralized focus surrounding the cochlea, you know you're dealing with otosclerosis. Labyrinthitis, you can have enhancement. MR is the investigation of choice. But when it progresses from a labyrinth to a sclerosis, then CT becomes extremely important. So this is a normal labyrinth. You see enhancement here. You know you're dealing with labyrinthitis. On MR, when you give contrast, there should be no enhancement within the labyrinth. 
if you see an enhancement, that means there is labyrinthitis. We look at ossificants. What happens? CT. The moment you say ossification, it is CT, it is not MR. And have a look at this. I've just zoomed this for you. This is the normal lateral semicircular canal, and you see the lateral semicircular canal completely ossified. Similarly, on the left. And look at the MR here, the 3D what we did. It looks as though it is amputated, meaning there is deposition of calcium and MR cannot see. Labyrinthitis ossificans, the entire cochlea here is involved, and the commonest we know is a post meningitic sequelae. Just show you one more illustration it's a whitewash, complete. You see this, you don't see vestibule, you don't see cochlea almost completely ossified, very classical labyrinthitis ossificans. Or else you should see a normal semicircular canal, you should see a vestibule, you should see cochlea. And look at the facial nerve here, nice, beautiful. It just goes up anteriorly, acute angle, and then comes back. MR is very bad for labyrinthitis ossificans, but what you see on MR is you don't see, meaning you don't see the turns of the cochlea, you don't see vestibule, the entire thing appears dark because of calcification. IAMs, normal IAM, stenotic internal artery canal. We are just going from the cochlea into the internal artery canal and this case was very, very interesting where this child for a cochlear implant, this is how it should be. Four dots, remember. One, two, three, four. The superior one is facial, superior division of the vestibular, inferior division of the vestibular, and the cochlear. And vestibulocochlear nerve is, uh, say, posterior, sorry, not posterior, it's behind, and then the superior is facial, inferior is cochlear, facial and cochlear should be of the same size. Please remember, when you do an MR, the facial and cochlear should be of the same size. And in this patient, there was no cochlea and there were no cochlear nerves at all. No cochlear nerves. So this is a case of aplasia of the cochlea and the cochlear nerve. And one more patient here. I'll just finish in two minutes. This is a duplication of the internal auditory canal. This patient had a duplication of IAC. In fact, Dr. Shankar Madkeri was the person who referred this. We had a look at it very closely and there was only one nerve there's just one nerve going into it. And look at the duplication so beautifully brought up. You have one canal above, one canal below, classical IAC duplication. And what happens in such cases, you have facial going in, vestibular going in, into different foramina. Bilateral, neuro, bilateral acoustic neurinomas, classical and F2. If you see bilateral acoustic neurinomas, you know you're dealing with NF2. Then there can be a brainstem infarct, classical brainstem infarct, or this patient with an adrenoleukodystrophy, lateral lemniscus involvement. These are all the auditory pathways, how they are involved. There could be medial geniculate body involvement, the posterior inferior portion of the thalamus. This is an infarct in the right temporal lobe. This is a tumor. Look at the irregular enhancement of the tumor. Last three slides here. Facial nerve. Cochlear and facial should be of the same size, and this patient has absence of facial nerve. Superior portion, no facial. Vestibular cochlear nerve is seen. Dehiscent facial nerve, Manoj already spoke to you. You look at this, there is no bony covering for the facial nerve. The tympanic portion is exposed. This is the lateral semicircular canal. Facial neuritis. Neuritis can enhance, do an MR, you see beautiful enhancement of the facial, the mastoid portion of the facial nerve showing an enhancement, so also the labyrinthine portion. This was, in fact, I think Vijendra operated on this along with Dr. Nanjun Dappa. This was a facial nerve neuroma. Look at the hourglass here. The mastoid portion was involved, and this was lying in the parapharyngeal space or the parotid space where it came down, and you see the constriction at the stylomastoid foramen. So you can pick up all this extremely well on the MR. So to conclude, MDCT and high-resolution MR have revolutionized imaging of the temporal bones. Wherever there is calcium or ossification, look at CT. Wherever you need to look at fluid structures, do an MR. And these two are excellent imaging tools, and they are complementary to each other, especially when you plan your cochlear implants. We have to do a CT. We have to do an MR. 
And these are not a one-stop shop. They're one-stop shops for the treating surgeon because you can look at morphology, tissue characterization, functional study, angiography, and spectroscopy. With this, let me conclude. Thank you very much for your attention.